First, note that there's almost always at least one question about one of these four heroes, and you can usually get it right if you just know which heroes go with which things. So memorize these simple word associations and you'll get one of the mythology questions on the intermediate exam right. If they say twelve labors, Hydra, Lion, or Cerberus, think Hercules. If they say Medusa or Andromeda, think Perseus. If they say Golden Fleece, Argonaut or Argo, or Medea, think Jason. And if they say Minotaur, Labyrinth, or Ariadne, think Theseus. That last one can be a little deceptive, because they sometimes ask about Daedalus, who built the Labyrinth to contain the Minotaur. But if they're asking about who killed the Minotaur, that's Theseus. So that's your basic introduction to the four most asked about heroes. I'll go into more detail now. Here are the heroes you should know who aren't part of the Trojan War cycle. First, the biggest and strongest. Hercules was the son of Jupiter and Alcmene. He is famous for doing twelve labors, which he had to do to atone for the crime of killing his first wife and their children, after Juno sent him into a fit of madness. These were twelve tasks that were supposed to be impossible, but he was the strongest man on earth. I won't talk about all twelve, here's four of the big ones. He killed the Nemean lion, which had impenetrable skin, so he had to strangle it because blades wouldn't work. He wore the lion skin for the rest of his life. He killed the Hydra, which was a big dragon that regrew two heads for every one he cut off. He took the belt of the Amazon queen Hippolyta. The belt had been a gift from Mars for her prowess in war. And he retrieved Cerberus from the underworld and brought him up to Earth. While he was down there, he also rescued his friend Theseus. Next, Daedalus, who was the world's greatest inventor. He lived on Crete and worked for King Minos, and he built the labyrinth to contain the Minotaur. Later, King Minos locked him and his son Icarus in the labyrinth, and he built wings out of feathers and wax so they could fly away. He warned Icarus not to fly too close to the sun, so his wings wouldn't melt. But Icarus got carried away and flew too close to the sun. He fell into the sea and died. Daedalus lived on. Theseus is the other hero with the labyrinth and the Minotaur, the man-eating monster with the head of a bull and the body of a man. He was the son of the king of Athens, Aegeus, and went to Crete to kill the Minotaur. He got help from the king's daughter, Ariadne. He found his way through the labyrinth using thread and killed the Minotaur. He took Ariadne as he escaped back to Athens, but he decided he'd gotten all he wanted from her and abandoned her on an island on their way back. He's really not a good guy. When he'd left Athens, he'd promised his father to change the ship's black sails for white ones if he'd been successful, but he forgot. So when Aegeus saw the ships in the distance with black sails, he thought his son had been killed and jumped into the sea, which is why it's now called the Aegean Sea. Later, Theseus and his friend Perithous went to the underworld together to try to kidnap Proserpina, the queen of the underworld, as Perithous's bride. They failed. Perithous died, and Theseus got frozen in place. He wasn't rescued until Hercules passed by on his labor to collect Cerberus and decided to bring Theseus with him too. Jason was sent to find the Golden Fleece. He sailed in a ship called the Argo and assembled a team of heroes to help him, called the Argonauts. Hercules, Atalanta, and Orpheus were all part of the Argonauts. He also got help from a sorceress named Medea, who betrayed her father to help him. When he left her for a younger woman, she, according to some versions, killed all the children they'd had together. Perseus was the son of Jupiter and Danae, and his grandfather was a king who didn't want him to exist, so he put him and his mother out to sea in a box when he was born. Perseus grew up to kill Medusa, who was one of the Gorgons, snake-haired monster women who turned people to stone by looking at them. On his way home, he also rescued Andromeda from a sea monster. Bellerophon was the hero who tamed Pegasus, the winged horse who was born from the neck of Medusa when Perseus killed her. Bellerophon also killed the Chimera, a monster that is a combination of a lion, a goat, and a snake. Then he tried to ride Pegasus up to Olympus to challenge the gods, so they killed him. Orpheus was the greatest musician ever. When he played his lyre, animals and the rest of nature came to listen. Full-on Disney princess. When his wife Eurydice died, Orpheus walked down into the underworld and used his music to convince Pluto to give her back. Pluto said he would, but only if Orpheus walked back out first, and never once looked back to check if Eurydice was following him. Orpheus looked back when he was out, but Eurydice wasn't yet, so he lost her again. Atalanta was the fastest woman in the world, and one of the rare female heroes. She was the only female Argonaut, and the first to wound the Caledonian boar, a hunt that a bunch of heroes took part in. She would only marry a man who could beat her in a foot race, which no one could. But then Hippomenes distracted her by throwing some irresistible golden apples during the race, and beat her when she left the path to get them. Oedipus became the king of Thebes by answering the riddle of the Sphinx. 
The Sphinx was a lion with a woman's head, who asked a riddle of everyone trying to enter or leave Thebes, and she ate anyone who failed to answer it correctly. Oedipus broke that curse by answering the riddle. And we're not going to talk about any more of that story. One more time, these are your pre-Trojan War heroes and monsters. Now for the Trojan War cycle, one of the biggest load-bearing stories in mythology. I'll tell this in six parts. The Wedding of Thetis and Peleus, The Judgment of Paris, The Face That Launched a Thousand Ships, The Rage of Achilles, The Trojan Horse, and The Aftermath. The mess all started at the wedding of the sea nymph Thetis to the mortal man Peleus, who would soon become the parents of Achilles. All the gods and goddesses were invited, except for Discordia, or Eris, the personification of discord. So she tossed in a golden apple marked to the fairest. All the goddesses argued over who deserved it, especially Juno, Minerva, and Venus. They tried to get Jupiter to judge the contest, but he didn't want to get involved, so they got a neutral judge. The three goddesses went to Paris, a Trojan prince, and each offered him a bribe to choose her. Paris chose Venus because she promised him the most beautiful woman in the world, which was Helen of Sparta, and never mind that she was already married. Paris went to Sparta and stole Helen from her husband, Menelaus, king of Sparta, then fled home to Troy. Troy is also known as Ilium, hence the name the Iliad. The Greeks pulled together the biggest army ever assembled to go get Helen back from Troy, which is why Helen is called the face that launched a thousand ships. At first, the winds wouldn't blow the Greek fleet to Troy, so Agamemnon sacrificed his own daughter Iphigenia for favorable winds. But Troy had excellent defensive walls and a good army, so the Greeks had to set up a siege, which lasted for ten years. While the two sides are locked in battle for ten years, let's talk about the important players on each side. On the Trojan side, Priam was the king of Troy and the father to Hector, Paris, and Cassandra. Hecuba was his queen. Paris was the son of Priam who started all this by stealing Helen. He fought with a bow and arrow and is usually portrayed as a coward. The greatest hero of Troy was Hector, another son of Priam. He had a wife named Andromache and a son called Astyanax, and there's a touching moment between the three of them that is one of the most humanizing scenes in the Iliad. Cassandra was a prophetess who was cursed by Apollo. She saw the future, but no one believed what she said. They thought she was mad. Finally, there's Aeneas, who was the only Trojan hero to escape Troy alive. He went on to found a new city in Italy, which became the ancestors of the Romans. For more about him, see my history video. On the Greek side, you have Agamemnon, the commander who sacrificed his daughter for favorable winds. He was the brother of Menelaus, and he carried an ancestral curse because of evil done by his father Atreus. Menelaus was the king of Sparta and husband of Helen, so it was him and Agamemnon trying to recover the family's honor that started the war. He is also affected by the curse of the house of Atreus. Helen of Sparta was, of course, the lady that got stolen to start the whole thing. There is an unfortunate tradition of blaming her for the war. Odysseus was the cleverest of the Greek leaders. He was king of Ithaca, and he always had a trick or a lie ready. And Achilles was the greatest of all Greek warriors. He was the son of Thetis and Peleus, whose wedding led to the start of the war. When he was young, his mother Thetis dipped him in the sticks to make him invulnerable. The only weak spot he had left was his heel, where his mother had held him when she dipped him. So of course he only died when he got hit there, but that comes later, so no spoilers. Now we come to the Iliad, which has a much narrower scope than a lot of people realize. It starts in the tenth year of the war. Agamemnon stole Achilles' slave woman for himself, a woman named Briseis that Achilles had kidnapped while massacring a town. Because Briseis was part of Achilles' glory, this was an insult to his honor. So Achilles refused to fight for Agamemnon and left to sulk in his tent for several days. The Greeks started to lose, and Agamemnon begged Achilles to come back, but he wouldn't budge. Finally, the man closest to Achilles, Patroclus, convinced Achilles to let him go into battle in his place. Patroclus charged into battle wearing Achilles' armor and killed a lot of Trojans, but Hector killed Patroclus. This sent Achilles into a rage, and he came back to the war to kill Hector. Afterward, Achilles refused to return Hector's body as was required. Instead, he dragged it around the walls of Troy for days to desecrate it. Finally, Priam snuck into the Greek camp at night and asked Achilles personally for his son's body back. Achilles received Priam with hospitality and finally listened to reason and gave Hector back, which was the end of the Iliad. In the myths immediately following the Iliad, Achilles kept killing Trojans and their allies. This included the Amazon queen Penthesilea, whom he fell in love with after he took off her helmet, but it was too late. She was already dead. Then Achilles finally died when Paris shot him in his vulnerable heel with an arrow. The war finally ended with the Trojan horse. 
There are a few different traditions of who came up with the trick, but often it's Odysseus who had the idea, which would be in character. The Greeks pretended to go home, and left a giant wooden horse, pretending it was an offering to Minerva, but actually hiding soldiers in it. The Trojans debated what to do with the horse, and at least two Trojans told them not to trust it. Cassandra, who no one believed, and a priest named Leocoon. This is where the phrase beware of Greeks even bearing gifts comes from, since the horse was really a trick to kill them. Then a Greek named Sinon showed up to feed the Trojans a believable lie about the horse representing the favor of Minerva. Minerva, who was on the Greeks' side because she didn't win the golden apple, collaborated by sending snakes to kill Laocoon. The Trojans believed the story and brought the horse inside the walls. The Greeks waited until nightfall, then came out and burned Troy to the ground. In the aftermath of the Trojan War, Menelaus got Helen back and went home to Sparta, where weirdly everything was forgiven and they lived happily ever after. Agamemnon took Cassandra the prophetess home as one of his enslaved war prizes. His wife, Clytemnestra, who was Helen's sister, had been planning revenge because Agamemnon sacrificed their daughter. She killed both Agamemnon and Cassandra with an axe. Then their son Orestes killed Clytemnestra to avenge his father, and the Furies pursued him for killing his own mother. Apollo then decided that the violence had gone far enough, and called off the Furies, ending the curse of the house of Atreus with Orestes. The Trojan Aeneas escaped to wander for a while before fulfilling his destiny, to found a new city in Italy. You probably already know that the longest story from after the war is Odysseus's journey home, told in Homer's Odyssey. I'll hit the high points here. Odysseus blinded the man-eating Cyclops Polyphemus, who was the son of Neptune, so Neptune turned against him and sent storms to keep blowing Odysseus off course for ten years. Among his adventures were the island of the Lotus Eaters, who ate an intoxicating fruit that made his sailors forget their desire to get home. He met Circe, a witch who turned some of his sailors into pigs. He went to the underworld to get advice from the legendary blind prophet Tiresias. He passed the sirens, bird women who sing to lure sailors to their deaths. He put wax over his sailors' ears so they couldn't hear them, but had himself tied to the mast so he could hear the song safely. He had to sail between Scylla and Charybdis near Sicily. Scylla is a many-headed monster that eats sailors, and Charybdis is a giant whirlpool, so he had to stay close enough to Scylla to be in danger, or the ship would get sucked into Charybdis. And on the island of the sun, his sailors killed and ate some of the sun god's cattle, which doomed them all to death as punishment. Finally, Odysseus made it home alone, to his wife Penelope and his son Telemachus. He disguised himself as a beggar, and killed the over 100 men who were there trying to marry his wife. I'll end part two by talking about the underworld. Remember that in Roman and Greek thought, all mortals, good and bad, went underground after death. The underworld was ruled by Pluto and Proserpina. It had five rivers, including the river Styx that you crossed to get in. The gods swore unbreakable oaths on the Styx. There's also the river Levi, which was the river of forgetfulness. Spirits drank from the Levi to forget their old lives before getting reincarnated. Charon was the ferryman who brought you over the river Styx in his boat. The ancients put coins on the mouths of the dead to pay Charon. If you didn't have a coin to pay him, you had to wander for a hundred years before entering the underworld. Cerberus was the giant three-headed guard dog of the underworld. Most spirits just had a neutral experience in the underworld. A few of the most glorious heroes got rewarded in the Elysian fields, and a few of the worst people who went against the gods were punished in Tartarus. Most famously, Sisyphus had to roll a rock uphill for eternity, and it always fell back down. Tantalus was hungry and thirsty, but food and drink always stayed just outside his reach. And Ixion was spun on a flaming wheel. Katabasis is when a mortal who is still alive goes down to the underworld. Here are the heroes you need to know who made trips to the underworld. Orpheus, the great musician, came down to get his wife Eurydice back and failed when he looked back at her too soon. Psyche was Cupid's wife, and he had left her, so she'd gone to Venus for help. Venus set her a series of impossible tasks to get him back, including going to the underworld to borrow some of Proserpina's beauty. Theseus and his friend Perithous went down to try to abduct Proserpina to be Perithous's bride. They failed, and Perithous died down there, while Theseus got frozen in place. Hercules went down on his twelfth and final labor to borrow Cerberus for a while. He rescued Theseus while he was down there. Odysseus went down to consult the blind prophet Tiresias, and Aeneas made a similar journey to get advice from his dead father. Aeneas was led into the underworld by the Cumaean Sibyl, an Italian oracle connected to Apollo. And that's it for part two. If you're taking the intermediate exam, happy studying. Upper levels, see you for one more video.